Good morning, everyone. Good to be with you for worship today, and hello to all of you with us online. We know you're out there because we see the traffic online, and it is just good to be with you wherever you are joining us from this morning. Um, I made a little announcement last Sunday morning and uh, have an update for you this morning, so maybe this is the first time you're going to hear this, maybe not. Um, I did write it out because as a preacher, I know that holds me to brevity, so you're welcome for that. Um, But after dealing with discomfort and dizziness and various other symptoms for a long time, uh, we recently learned of a meningioma tumor that is growing on my brain. Thankfully, and this is only with God's help, Uh, Should we have ever seen this doctor in Dallas, Dr. Samuel Barnett, I would love it if you would pray for him by name, Uh, no relation, but we like his name. He saw Andrea and I on Monday and confirmed a few things. Uh, The tumor is large, it has caused severe swelling on my brain, and it needs to come out. So only God, again, could have opened the door to this surgeon who is one of the best across the United States of America, and my surgery has already been scheduled for May 24th. Very quickly, and we praise God for that. It'll be at UT Southwestern in Dallas. Uh, It'll be a pretty invasive surgery with a road to recovery ahead. Um, Our family is doing our best right now to prepare logistically for this. This is our first time, so we're figuring it out as we go. Um, As a church, we have a plan. We've been talking a lot about it for the last week, uh, and I feel nothing but love and support from our staff, from our leadership team, from our superintendent who has reached out and will come visit this week, and from you. As I think about you and pray for you, I feel the call on my life to serve you. And being one of your pastors is one of my greatest delights. But over the last week, you have ministered to Andrea and to me and to our family in ways that we will never repay you. There are no words of gratitude that we could express. So thank you for that. We are calling this, we have named it Operation Through. It's Operation Through. We're walking through this. It's Isaiah 43, 1 and 2. I shared it last week. I never thought I would have a brain surgery passage, but this has become mine. And I'm reading it to you again today to encourage you, as it's been an encouragement to me. And I just want to read it to you for any present struggle that you might be facing, any trial that you carried into this place of worship with you today. So receive this word from the Lord. But now this is what the Lord says, he who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you, I have summoned you by name, you are mine. When you pass through, go ahead and say through, the waters I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you, and when you walk through the fire, You will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. And everyone said to that promise, Amen. Amen. Now a fun introduction that I get to make. Dr. John Winrick is here today, and here's a brief introduction to him before he preaches. Lived as a missionary overseas in a persecuted nation. Local church pastor, church planting pastor, revitalization pastor of a 113 year old church in Portland, Oregon. Director of congregational vitality for 10 years in our denomination. Leadership coach on four continents. Seminary professor. One of Dave and I's absolute favorite, by the way. Executive Minister of Start and Strengthen Churches and the former president of the Evangelical Covenant Church. Served our denomination faithfully. 
a very faithful witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And how very thankful, John, I am to say that you are my dear and beloved friend. I love you very much. I know your greatest treasure is your family, and so I will not introduce them. I know you want to do so. But I am going to ask our Redeemer family, will you please stand to your feet and honor this man and welcome him to Redeemer Church? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, good morning. I'm so happy to be here with you today. Yes, it was quite an experience having Adam and Dave in my seminary classes. I really love these guys. We just really click, could spend all, yeah, give each other a high five. Look at that. And uh, it's just great when you can just be yourself and at home with, uh, you know, some good brothers and sisters in the Lord. And that's what I feel like today. This is my first trip to Tulsa. And when I landed at the airport on Friday afternoon, look who greeted me. <laughs> now, I have a million and a half miles on United, but this has never happened to me before in over 20 years of travel. And I just looked up to heaven, I go, Father, this is going to be a great trip. <laughs> it's never happened before. So I want to bring you greetings, as Adam said, from my family. Here's a picture of us. Julie and I uh, have been married for 36 years. We live in the Portland, Vancouver area. Julie grew up in Portland. I grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Go Eagles. Hello. I see you out there. I see that hand. Yes, way to go. And the uh, Lord has blessed us with three sons, Jonathan, Joel, Jordan, two daughter-in-laws, Laura and Mary, and two granddaughters, ages three and five, Brooklyn, and Sloan. And the, uh, the other night, Sloan slept over at our house. And one of my favorite things being a grandfather is the bedtime routine. So Julie and I, she's Minnie, I'm Pop Pop, we go through our routine and trust me, if we get anything out of sequence, we hear about it. <laughs> That's not the way we do it at home. Okay, okay, we'll, we'll be okay here. So one this night, like, Julie and I are just laying down with Sloan before we tuck her in at night and turn off the light. And I looked right into Sloan's eyes and I said, Sloan, Minnie and Pop Pop love you so much. And she looked right back into my eyes and said, I love bacon. <laughs> Come on, what is that? Well, I don't take it for granted, and neither does Julie, that we get to live within an hour strive of all our children and grandchildren. And we realize that not everybody gets to do that. And the older I get, the more important I find that becoming to me. Uh, Julie and I have some very close friends, and these are really good friends because all four of us love being together. And if you can find another couple, if you're a couple, and everybody gets along, that's something pretty special. You know what I mean? We all like being together. And we go out to dinner a couple times a month and meet each other for coffee. And, and this last time we were together, they just said how lonely they were. I go, we're your friends. Come on. No, that's not what we mean. <laughs> See, they have two older kids, and one moved north to Seattle, three hours north of Portland. They rarely see each other. And the one later this month is moving to Switzerland to work there for three years as a glass blower. Interesting job. He's really good at it. And life hasn't turned out for them the way they thought it would be as a closer, geographically, relationally connected family. And we really hurt for them. We grieve for them. They're our good friends. And then Julie and I were in a small group a couple weeks ago, and there were about six or seven couples, and one of the dads in his mid-50s, he said, I got a call from my 29-year-old son yesterday, and I'm really worried about him because he said, Dad, I'm really lonely, and it's not good. 29 years old. I don't know about you, but... 
Maybe it's selective memory, I don't know, but I'm just hearing more and more stories about loneliness and isolation, are you? We read about it on the news, we may feel it ourselves. So if you're feeling lonely, you're not alone. And if you're not experiencing loneliness, I guess and I would bet that you probably have a friend or a family member who is feeling lonely and it's not a good thing. Which is why this report caught my eye earlier last week. The Surgeon General of the United States, Dr. Vivek Murthy, published a report entitled Our Epidemic of Loneliness and Isolation. And this fascinated me because I was like, I've been thinking about this and feeling this for months. I was very curious. Here's an excerpt. In recent years, about one in two adults in America reported experiencing loneliness. And that was before the COVID-19 pandemic cut off so many of us from friends, loved ones, and support systems, exasperating loneliness and isolation. Loneliness and isolation represent profound threats to our health and well-being. But we have the power to respond. A culture of connection rests on core values of kindness, respect, service, and commitment to one another. Everyone contributes to the collective culture of social connection by regularly practicing these virtues. Behaviors are both learned from and reinforced by the groups we participate in and the communities we are a part of. Thus, the more we observe others practicing these values, the more they will be reinforced in us. When I read these words and reflected deeply upon them, I thought about the good and beautiful kingdom of God and how the local church ought to be an expression of that good and beautiful kingdom. I thought about you and Redeemer Church in this series that we're wrapping up today called The One and Others. Forgive one another, love one another, honor one another, serve one another, encourage one another. A hundred times one another phrase is mentioned in the New Testament. Fifty-nine of those times are about how we relate or ought not to relate to our sisters and brothers in Christ and in those in our community and world. I also thought about how these one another's are an antidote to the epidemic of loneliness and isolation. And I would throw in there addiction as well. Let's face it. We find ourselves living in a unique cultural moment. Redeemer Church, through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, can model a culture of connection by practicing the one and others. Throughout this series on one and others, I've watched some of the sermons online and they're fantastic. I've noticed something, a pattern of the Holy Spirit. Have you noticed this too? You see, we can't practice any of the one and others without the Holy Spirit. And the more we develop a conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit, which by the way is one of the affirmations of the Evangelical Covenant Church, the more we experience compelling Christian community. And this happens by what Dallas Willard calls, have you ever heard of Dallas Willard? He's my patron saint, by the way, and the pastor I work with in Oregon, his patron saint is C.S. Lewis. So we have these quote wars between C.S. Lewis and Dallas Willard. It's really fun, but I digress. So he would put it this way. He talks about a principle called indirect effort, indirect effort. And it goes like this, practicing becoming the kind of person who would normally and naturally be filled and guided by the Holy Spirit. And guess what? The one and others just happen sort of on their own, from the inside out, organically, without even ever trying. Now, it does take training, and trying is so much different than training. But as we train, these behaviors become second nature to us. 
muscle memory, reflex, instinct. In the words of that great theologian, Bono, (laughs) the song sings us. Would you say that with me? The song sings us. Sisters and brothers, if you get that, you understand what spiritual transformation in Christ is all about through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit mediates the presence of Jesus in our lives and we receive the Spirit at conversion. When we say yes to Jesus and we put our trust and faith and confidence in him and we cross that line of faith and we step into the kingdom of God and begin to live life in the kingdom, that good and beautiful enduring kingdom. While we respect the mystery of the Holy Spirit, because there's so much about the Holy Spirit we will never understand until we're face to face with Jesus, we remain curious. It's good to be curious, to learn more. So we're going to take a deep dive into the connection between the Holy Spirit and the one another's of Scripture. First, the Holy Spirit is a person. Would you say that with me? The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit has intellect. The Holy Spirit has will. The Holy Spirit has emotion. All the elements and distinctives of personhood. Now, I agree with you, the Holy Spirit doesn't have the body like we do, but that doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is not a person. By the way, the Holy Spirit is not an atmosphere. The Holy Spirit is not a universe. The Holy Spirit is not an impersonal cosmic force. The Holy Spirit is not an aura or an energy field. The Holy Spirit is none of those things. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is a person. Because the Holy Spirit is a person, we can get to know and interact with the Holy Spirit. Look at how Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit in John chapter 14, 26. He talks about the Holy Spirit as an actual person with personal agency. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said. In this text, Jesus uses the word Helper to describe the person and work of the Holy Spirit. And in Greek, this word is parakletos. Parakletos means a comforter, someone who comes alongside of you, puts his or her arm around you, someone who's a helper during the hard times of life. Let me tell you here today, the Holy Spirit is the ultimate one another, amen, who comes alongside us and indeed even fills us with the very presence of Jesus himself. There is comfort and there is hope and there is experience in knowing the Holy Spirit as a person the ultimate one another. I love what Jesus said. One time he said, I am not alone. My Father is with me. And that same spirit, the spirit of Jesus, is the same spirit that indwells every believer. We are not alone because the Holy Spirit is with us. Amen? Amen. It's a beautiful thing because the Holy Spirit is a person. Second, the Holy Spirit is God. Would you say that with me? The Holy Spirit is God. The God of the Bible is a triune God. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. One God in three persons, coexistence and co-eternal. Listen, the Holy Spirit is one with but distinct from the Father and the Son. Take a look at this graphic that illustrates this concept. On the outside of the triangle, 
The Son is not the Father. The Father is not the Son. The Holy Spirit, the Father is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Son. But on the inside of the triangle, the Son is God. The Father is God. The Holy Spirit is God. One God in three persons. And because the Holy Spirit is God, the Holy Spirit is worthy of our love, our honor, and our devotion. Think about it. Muse with me for a moment. Without the Holy Spirit, there would be no creation because Genesis 1 said the Spirit was hovering over the primordial chaos and stew. Without the Holy Spirit, there would be no Old Testament prophets or prophecy because those prophets were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Without the the Holy Spirit, there would be no incarnation because the Spirit overshadowed Mary and the virgin shall give birth to a son. Without the Holy Spirit, there would be no church because the Holy Spirit gave birth to the church on the day of Pentecost. Without the Holy Spirit, there would be no birth in Christ because the Holy Spirit is the one who regenerates and awakens the soul dead from sin. Without the Holy Spirit, there would be no spiritual gifts because it's the Spirit who gives the gifts to each believer to equip the church for mission. Without the Holy Spirit, there would be no Bible because the Bible is God-breathed and God-breathed, a.k.a. is code for Holy Spirit. And without the Holy Spirit, there would be no adoption into God's forever family because when the Holy Spirit comes into our human spirit through faith in Christ, it's the Holy Spirit who cries out within our human spirit, Abba, Father. And without the Holy Spirit, there would be no hope because the Holy Spirit is a deposit, an inheritance, guaranteeing our salvation. I say all of this to demonstrate that the Holy Spirit is a bona fide, certified member of the Trinity. Is that okay with you today? Woo! And as happy as I am about that, I am equally sad about this. Sadly, the Holy Spirit is ignored by many Christians. No wonder we often struggle with the one in others. I like what theologian Clark Pinnock says. Modern Christians are largely content to be Trinitarian in belief, but binitarian in practice. I like to say that for many Christians, the Holy Spirit is kind of like the Cinderella of the Trinity. By the way, now that I have two granddaughters, ages three and five, I'm learning all about the world of princess this and princess that and how each princess has her own clothing line and her own set of matching jewelry accessories. Mm Mm-hmm. That's what I'm learning as a grandfather. I'm getting schooled on all this stuff. And I'm learning more about Cinderella than I ever knew possible. There is Cinderella off in a corner somewhere, out of sight, and not treated like a full-fledged member of the family. Like, just do the work, but don't get into my space. Just because theologians describe the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Trinity doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is hiding in some corner somewhere or sitting quietly in the back seat or worse yet, locked up in the trunk and we don't even know what's back there. The Holy Spirit is a person and the Holy Spirit is a full-fledged member of the Trinity. And speaking of the Trinity, do you realize that all the one another's flow out of the perfect communion of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? That at the center of the universe, at the center of reality, is a loving community of a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Gordon Fee 
puts it this way. God lives in eternal relationship with himself as a triune God. The relational implications of this for us, both toward God and toward one another, should become a primary part of our paradigm of life in the Spirit as we live together. The Spirit is foundational to our entire experience and understanding of our present life in Christ. God created the universe out of this perfect circle of perfect love. He created us male or female. He made us in his image as relational beings. Sadly, unfortunately, tragically, sin marred that image and destroyed that relationship. And you see, this is why Jesus came, to redeem the image to restore the relationship, to forgive the sin, to open up the doors of the kingdom of God, making it accessible to every single person who would place their trust and confidence in Jesus as Lord, and to welcome us into the fellowship of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now, mind you, we don't become God, but we are welcomed by God through faith and union in Christ into this union and fellowship. And this union is manifest when we surrender our lives to Christ and the Holy Spirit comes into our human spirit and mediates the presence of Jesus in our lives. I love how Dallas Willard puts it. He says something like, you know, when whether we're feeling good or feeling discouraged, about our relationship with God, and you feel that sometimes, and so do I. So whether we're feeling encouraged or discouraged about our relationship with God, we can be at home in the fellowship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The church was made, the church was made to reflect this communion of eternal love, coexistent, co-eternal between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the triune Godhead. The Holy Spirit's a person, the Holy Spirit is, and, is God, and third, the Holy Spirit empowers us for mission. Just before Jesus ascended into heaven, he told his disciples, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about but you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It's like Jesus is saying, ready, set, wait. And why must the disciples wait? Because if you want to do the work of God, you need the power of God. Amen. Amen. If we want to do the work of God, we need the power of God. Because I'm here to tell you the devil laughs at human strength, but runs away in fright at the name and power of Jesus. That's what you can count on. That's what you can count on. So on the day of Pentecost, what happens? The Holy Spirit comes down, fills these believers, and the church is born. And the Holy Spirit was the game changer. That's because the Holy Spirit is the blazing center of the mission. Now, then, and in the future. You know what the Holy Spirit did? The Spirit lit up. And I literally mean lit up this ragtag group of fearful disciples, men and women. They were all gathered there and through the Holy Spirit transformed them into a courageous band of sisters and brothers who would turn the world upside down through the power and love of the gospel message empowered by the Holy Spirit. You see, this mission is a relational mission. We are mission friends, which, by the way, is the original name of the Evangelical Covenant Church, Mission 
friends. Would you say that with me? Mission, friends. I love this because I, I got to tell you why I love this so much. Because the best friends I've ever made in life Amen. are those men and women that I've met on mission because the Holy Spirit brought us together. And I feel so blessed today. I feel so blessed abundantly because of these strong relationships that I enjoy so thoroughly. And why? Because we're mission friends, and I wouldn't have met them otherwise. Do you feel that blessing? Let the song sing you. So the Holy Spirit's a person, the Holy Spirit is God, the Holy Spirit empowers us for mission, and last, the Holy Spirit is the key to compelling Christian community. Think about this, the Holy Spirit is the one who creates community, sustains community, and directs that community. Let's unpack this. The Holy Spirit creates Christian community by bringing Christ followers together. The church is not the building. Hey, didn't we learn this during COVID? The church is not the building. The church is the body of Christ gathered in the name of Christ. I find it fascinating that when Jesus first talked about the church, he used the word ekklesia. He borrowed a very common neutral Greek word called ekklesia, and it basically means to call out in order to gather together in an assembly. Even before the church is born, Jesus envisions it as communal. It's the one another's. And look at this verse by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 13, 14. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. That word fellowship of the Holy Spirit, that word fellowship is koinonia. Koinonia is the fellowship produced by the Holy Spirit among the sisters and brothers of the church who are indwelt in dwelt with the Holy, Sp Holy Spirit. It's communal. It's the one in others. So the Holy Spirit not only creates this community, but sustains this community by the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, forbearance, or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. The fruit of the Spirit are the core values, the building blocks, the virtues of strong community. And with these virtues flowing out of our relationship with Jesus, empowered and mediated by the Holy Spirit, we can do anything we want because, you see, you're filled with the Holy Spirit and you wouldn't even think of doing anything that isn't loving or joyful or patient or peaceful or gentle. Are you with me on this? It's almost second nature, muscle memory, reflex. And this is what I love about walking with Jesus. There is so much freedom because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Amen. The Holy Spirit creates community, the Holy Spirit sustains community, and the Holy Spirit directs community. Oh, I love to talk about communal discernment. There is an intriguing and fascinating story in Acts chapter 15 when the early church got together to discern a critical issue. It was tense. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, they were able to practice the one another's and come to a conclusion that was glorifying to God and helpful and good for neighbor. And when this meeting was all said and done, this is the commentary on the meeting. Acts 15, 28. It seemed good to who? The Holy Spirit and to us. Would you say this verse with me? It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Do you know what this means? 
It means that the Holy Spirit was there in person, on sight, and active in the decision-making process. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is a person who directs compelling Christian community. That's the kind of meeting I want to be a part of. There's a book by Patrick Lencioni called Death by Meeting. This was not death by meeting. This was life by meaning. And the Holy Spirit was the game changer. Actively involved in communal discernment. It's like communal discernment is like dancing with the Holy Spirit. Keeping in step with the Spirit. And we follow the Spirit wherever the Spirit leads. You see, at its core, Christianity is more, so much more than just an individual experience. It was always intended to be a communal experience. And that's why so much of the New Testament is given to the one and others. Hebrews 10.25 says, Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. John Ortberg uses this illustration of barbecues in summertime. I love the smell. It is a smell that signals summer is coming. And he talks about how the briquettes burn best when they're bunched up together. Those barbecue masters in the congregation today, you really appreciate this. But when you take one of those briquettes and separate it from the other group, it burns out. And that's what happens to us when we're isolated from Christian community. I like how Alcoholics Anonymous says it. I get drunk. We get sober. Recovery never happens in isolation. It always happens in community. Here's what we know. The Holy Spirit's a person. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit empowers us for mission. And the Holy Spirit is the key to compelling Christian community. I made a friend at church about two months ago, and I came a little bit early that day, and I wasn't preaching so I could hang out more, and I noticed a guy right by the coffee table, and he was there by himself. So I'm going to meet that guy. So I walk over, and I'm only there, this is only my second Sunday, I said, hi, my name's John Matures, he said Chuck, and I said, how long have you been here? Oh, this is only my second Sunday. Mine too. So we got to talk a little bit, we got coffee, and I said, hey, you want to sit together in the sanctuary? He said, sure. So we sat down, and you know, I always have a seat between me and another guy. I'm sitting, it's just a man thing to do. You know, put our coffees there, our cell phones, bulletins. You, some of you guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I'm seeing that, yeah. So you know how that goes. And this is only the second time or third time, and we're sitting in the service, hearing a great message like you often hear, uh, here at uh, Redeemer, and I, and I just feel this nudge of the Holy Spirit. Pray for Chuck. I go, Lord, I just met this guy a week or two ago. Pray for Chuck. So after the service, when the benediction was given, I say, hey, Chuck, great to see you today. Can I pray for you? And every Sunday we met, he told me just a little bit of the story. He's in a tough spot. He just moved there from southern Oregon tough spot. And so I prayed for him. Lord, thank you for Chuck. You love him so much. You care for him. Bless him this week. Give him your strength. Let him know he's not alone. And he matters so much to you. Amen. And I looked into his eyes and he was crying. And I was getting a little misty myself. He's come back every single week He's still in a tough spot, but I can tell you, he's a little less lonely and more convinced and assured and at peace that there's a God out there who loves him so much. That's practicing the one another's, folks. And it doesn't take much. Sometimes all it calls for is a smile, a hug, a handshake. Way to go, a cup of coffee, 
or a prayer. So when the Holy Spirit, who is the ultimate one another, gives you a leading to reach out, follow it. Because there's fruit at the end of that rainbow. And that fruit is someone, not just you, who will experience the love of God. In this cultural moment, we have an opportunity to model that culture of connection with Christ and with one another through the Holy Spirit. We have the opportunity at Redeemer through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to lead by example when it comes to the one another's in a world that has gone absolutely mad. That's what the one another's are all about. And that's the way we remind each other that we were made for more. Heavenly Father, thank you for equipping us through your spirit to become the kind of church that normally and naturally carries out the one another's. Help us to excel in this area. Jesus, this is your church, and I pray that you'll continue to draw people to yourself through the loving and faithful and generous and fruitful spirit that I've seen here this weekend. And I'm asking you to release the fullness of your Holy Spirit upon this congregation for mission. We love you, Lord, because you first loved us. Open our eyes and our hearts and our hands to love one another for your glory and for neighbor's good. And may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless you. Amen.